And the thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let's pray. Lord Christ, now that we've heard your word read, and as I get ready to proclaim your gospel and to proclaim you, I pray that uh, you would remember us and you would come into this place, and that you would be our king of kings, that we would bend our knees gladly to you, and may you, being our king, fill us with joy and hope and with strength and power. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> So we were at Christ the King Sunday, and it might strike you if you're thinking about it as a little odd that they portray Jesus hanging on the cross on Christ the King Sunday. You know, it's a really, it's a really interesting image to have in mind. And, and when you think about it, what that man, what that thief said to Jesus on the cross, you know, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. That's really a strange thing to say to a man who's being executed, isn't it? And it doesn't make much sense. You know, what did he see in that dying man hanging there to make him say something like this? I mean, Jesus' friends didn't see this, right? They had all left him. They had all abandoned him. And, and, and so what, what was it? What did he see? And my prayer this morning is that when all said and done this morning, we'll be able to see something of what that thief saw on the cross. And, uh, and that God will give me the strength and all of us the grace to see our king. So there are really two portraits of Jesus that I think we need to reconcile and bring them together to see how this can be so. Um, one is him hanging there on the cross like a criminal with other criminals, alone, seemingly defeated, an innocent victim of envy and political expediency. That's one image we have of Jesus on one hand. And, and the other portrait is hinted at in the things that people are saying to him as they mock him as he hangs on the cross. And they say things to him like, you know, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God. And what they mean by Christ, you know, Christ isn't his last name. You know, Joseph and Mary Christ knows. <laughs> Jesus Christ means he is Christ and Christos in the Greek is the anointed one, the Messiah. He is the, the king of the Jews, right? He's the anointed one of God, the heir of David, the undefeatable hero of the people of Israel and the one who was prophesied to rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That's the other portrait. It's him as God ruling all things. So which is it? You know, you and I, we're more, um, well, it's both, right? But we're going to figure out how that works together. We're more familiar with the first image that I laid out. You know, I sometimes call this flannel graph, Jesus. Did you ever grow up with flannel graph in Sunday school? I'm going to see your hands if you did. I'm curious. Yeah, flannel graph is, you know, the Sunday school teacher would have this easel. And on the easel, there'd be a big, like, board, maybe, you know, by this, by this. And it was covered in flannel. And they had little Bible character cutouts. You know, a Jesus and some disciples and some sheep or whatever, right? And they'd, and they'd stick it on the board. And you could use the flannel graph to recreate the Bible stories. It's a really effective visual. Obviously, it worked on me, right? I can still see several of them. And, uh, and what you see there in the flannel graph cutouts, the teacher, Sunday school teacher would stick on the board is images like little baby Jesus in the manger. All right, we're getting ready to reflect on that one soon. Um, you see Jesus with all the children. There'd be a little flannel graph with all the little children. He'd cut that out, stick that next to Jesus. Really nice guy with perfect hair. And... Uh, you know, or we've got, um, you know, the good shepherd, the healer, the teacher, the miracle worker, um, you know, the friend of sinners. And uh, I'm trying to remember if I ever saw Jesus hanging on the cross in flannel graph. I don't think I did. Susie's shaking her head. No, she doesn't remember that one either. <laughs> they try to keep it, I guess, uh, a little more palatable for young eyes and ears, even though they need to see it. Um, that's flannel graph Jesus. The portrait of, of Christ as king that we get out of the scriptures and we look at the Bible, especially the prophets, it doesn't have a lot in common with the flannel graph images from my Sunday school upbringing. All right, I'm going to read to you some of the things we see in the prophets, especially um, Revelation, what John saw. Compare um, sort of Sunday school Jesus, that presentation, children's storybook, with uh, the Jesus of the book of Revelation. All right? Chapter 19, starting at verse 11. 
Then I, John, saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. That wouldn't work well in Sunday school, would it? He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's a very dramatic and powerful portrait of Christ that John just painted for us. And, uh, you know, and think of on the cross, he's surrounded by people all around him. And what are they doing? They're mocking him. Making fun of him, right? Oh, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. Okay, hero, save yourself. Oh, you saved others, but you can't save yourself. How pathetic, you know. They're making fun of him. And then, uh, you know, what's he got in the air around him? He's got stereo sound. The two robbers on either side are also deriding him and mocking him. Save yourself and save us too. Come on, Christ. Come on, anointed one. David's son. Do your thing. That's what I thought. You know, they're just mocking him, you know. And, and that's what he's got surrounding him in this one portrait. But when you look to him seated on his throne in heaven, what's the scene there? What is surrounding him there? Revelation 7. He's surrounded by, John says, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And Paul pulls back the curtain for us a little bit in our reading, our epistle reading. You might pull out your bulletin and follow along with me in the second paragraph. He, he sort of pulls back the veil and shows us who is this Jesus that, that these disciples walked with and the one who was hanging on the cross. Starting in verse 15. I don't think it's marked on there as verse 15, but he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. He's the prince of it all. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Everything that's on earth and everything that exists was created by Jesus, the Son of God. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was outside uh, taking a walk uh, not too long ago and and the sky was exceptionally clear. And I could see, you could look up and you could see all the stars, right? And when you think about it, all the stars that I could see were just a fraction, a, the tiniest fraction of all the stars that are out there, right? The Milky Way galaxy has billions of giant flaming balls of gas in it, right? Stars. And hundreds of billions. And then there are hundreds of billions, maybe, you know, of, of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of stars in each of them. Jesus did that. And when he looks at the entire universe, when he looks at this earth, when he, when he looks at you and me, he's like, I did that. I made that and it is mine. He made all of it. And in the angels and they're all their immense power and glory, he's like, I made them and they are mine. I did it all. It says it doesn't matter if it's a spiritual thing or a physical thing or whatever. Paul says all things were created through him and for him. So 
They were made through Jesus. He's the agent of creation. And they were all made for Him, for His glory, for Him to enjoy, for His sake. And then he goes on. I mean, Paul is packing a lot in here. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of every Christian there is. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, him above all things preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. If we would understand who Jesus is rightly, I want to argue this morning that um, this image of Jesus that I've just read for you out of the scriptures is, needs to be the first when it comes to mind. This is him as he is from all eternity. The son of God, the origin of all creation, the one from everything is made. This needs to be what's in our mind. This is who he properly is in his fullness again, in all of his glory and power and might. You know, this is the one that Moses wanted to see when he said, I want to see your glory, God. And God says, man cannot see me and live. You couldn't even take in the glory of Christ, of the Son of God. You can't handle it, Moses. This is full on Jesus. And he is awesome in the true sense of the word. He's awesome. Isaiah agrees. He, he saw God and he cried out. He saw God on the throne, Jesus Christ. And he says, woe is me, I am lost. Ezekiel, you know, in other words, I, I'm dead, I can't be here. I'm dead. Ezekiel saw him and he fell his face. You know, Daniel saw him and Daniel says, I was greatly alarmed and the color fled from my face when he saw the living God. You know, Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, John. The same John who had walked with Jesus on the earth, right? He'd leaned on his, on his chest, you know, at the Last Supper, and his dear friend, the one whom Jesus loved, right? He says, you know, I saw the full Christ on this throne. You know, I saw him in all of his majesty and power. And he says, and I fell at his feet as though dead. I fell on my face. I said that completely wrong. There goes the moment. I fell on my face as though dead. You know, we just uh, came off of an election, didn't we? We like to think we can elect our leaders. He, he's not subject to any election, this king of glory. Right? He elects to do whatever pleases him and brings him glory. He's, he's king from all eternity. So who are we then? before this king. How do we think of ourselves rightly? I want to go back to that, our gospel reading for this morning. And I want to go back to the scene at the cross and, and I want you to see who is there with him. I, I think who we are in this story as we're thinking of it today, who are before this king, I think we're the thieves hanging on either side of Jesus. All right? I think that illustrates who we are. In the story, um, Luke calls them criminals. Matthew and Mark sort of give a bit more. What is their crime? They were robbers. They were thieves, they say. Men who had lived only for themselves. They had no shame, no regard for God. They did what they wanted to do. And in that, they're like every descendant of Adam and Eve. When Eve reached for the apple, she wasn't stealing a piece of fruit. Not really. What she was really doing there was, you know, she was tempted when the serpent told her that if she ate, she would be like God. She was reaching for divinity. She was reaching to put herself up by God. She was trying to make herself like God. And that is a kind of robbery. That is the worst kind. Right? And it describes all of us who are descendants of Adam and Eve. All of us before God all human race has been robbers. They've been, we've been rebels from the beginning. We've been positioning ourselves as the center of everything and living only to please ourselves. But I just finished a lot of scripture saying who's the center of everything and who are we to we live to please? Right? Only King Jesus. Um, you know, but 
this is what I'm doing. I'm sort of robbing, right? God, I'm trying to put myself at the center of things. Every time I disobey him, every time I, I, I forget God and just go about my day acting like I don't need him and I'm doing just fine on my own, and I'm not mindful of him in, 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 prayer, in prayer and gratitude, right? Every time my heart receives a gift that is good, something that is good, and I don't think to thank God, I'm just like the, one of those thieves hanging there on the other side, on either side of Christ. You know, Jesus' sentence was not just, but their sentence was. They even said so. Like, we, we've, we, we've got what's coming to us, you know. We're getting what we deserve. This one has not done anything to deserve this, right? This is who we are. And the presence of Jesus hanging there between the two of them tells us something else we need to understand about this King of Glory. That He has come into this world you know, and, and to, to dwell among sinners and robbers and thieves. And this tells us something of not only His glory and His awesome power, but His indescribable, bottomless love and His mercy and coming down among us. Because, you know, when the King looks on His glorious creation and He sees what we've done to the world, especially what we've done to ourselves... He doesn't decide to destroy it, but he goes looking for us. That's what he did when Adam and Eve had fallen, and they, they had tried to be like him, right? And then he cast them out of the, you know, and they're, they're, they're covering up themselves, and they're shame, and they're hiding. What does God do? He walks through the garden, and he says those wonderful words. He says, where are you? I mean, he knows where they are, but he's letting them know that he's seeking them. He wants them. He wants to be with them. And... He's not abandoned them, right? And even though they had left him, he is coming to them. His character has not changed because Jesus, we saw this a few weeks ago. What did he come to do? To seek and to save whom? The lost. He's still looking for sinners who are trying to hide from him, but those who belong to him. Where Adam and Eve had tried to seize divinity, Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that though Jesus was the king of heaven, he was very God of very God. He was everything the Father was. Nevertheless, says, Paul says, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, you know, to be seized jealously. He says, no, but he emptied himself and he took the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Where we grasp for divinity, he did not grasp for divinity, he grasped for humanity. He reached out to grasp for us. And he came to dwell among us mercifully, humbly, graciously, and lovingly. The king who made all there is reached out for us, for you and for me. What kind of king gets down in the mud and does that? You know, to come and take our place, to take our punishment so that we might live and become like him and live with him forever as a kingdom of priests to our God. What kind of king does that? You know, I once heard that Prince William um, was on a trip when he was uh, in his 20s and he was scrubbing toilets. Right? That says something about that man's character. But that's got nothing on Jesus Christ coming down and being born in a stable and all that, right? I mean, what a king we've got. You know, and, and this king did what he did. You know, we, we think this way so much and I really hope we can get away from this kind of thinking where we think that Jesus came down to give us a ticket to heaven so we could go hug our grandmas once again. And don't get me wrong, I love my grandmothers. And I can't wait to hug them. But that's not what he came ultimately to do. I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't make much sense because that's still all about you. Because your grandmother was once a little girl. And who does she want to go hug? Her grandmother. And she was once a little girl. She's looking for, right? Or her grandpa or whatever. Let's just get rid of the ad infinitum grandma hugging, all right? 
And let's really think about what he came to do and what he came to achieve in us. Uh, we got to cut to the chase. Really, all this longing to see grandma is really a longing, not for the embrace of some loved one, some family member, but for the embrace of God himself. What we're longing for in that life to come is the embrace of the king. It's the, his presence and his smile and his laughter as he sees us and delights over us and what he's done in us. That is what we were made for and that is our hope. That is where we are going and that is why he has done what he's done. Why the king of heaven humbled himself and came down so that we might be glorified and be with him. You know, the one who loved us from all eternity. The one who sustained us throughout all of our earthly pilgrimage. Who is bringing us safely home to him. He is the true desire and fulfillment of our heart. It is him and him alone. He's, he's our very being, you know. And, and so that day is going to come when we join um, Isaiah and, and Ezekiel and Daniel and John and all the rest. As they're gathered around the king. No more on the, are they on their faces Fearing him, but they are on their faces in gratitude and worship and joy because of what Jesus has done. And, and we will run to him in wonder and awe, to our hearts exploding the love and joy as he gathers us up as his children. And, and as the prizes that he has won to himself from sin and death, and in whom he is supremely glorified and shown to be unparalleled in his power and his love and his mercy and his ability to save. All of that for a bunch of thieves and robbers. You know, and I want us to think of the experience of uh, that one thief who repented. There were two, but one repented, didn't he? And he turned to Christ. I want, I want to think about that and, and think about the process that we need to go through to see our king rightly. You know, Matthew and Mark again tell us that at first, both of them were mocking Jesus. They were both deriding him. They're both making fun of him, reviling him. But Luke reports that it seems like something in this one changed. Something, something changes his heart, his mind. And something opens his eyes to see something of who this Jesus really is. Right? And you can tell, by the way, he, you can tell that he loves Jesus all of a sudden. Because what does he do? He defends him. He rebukes that other thief. He says, don't you fear God? He's like, shut up, you fool. Stop mocking him. Right? This man has done nothing wrong. And then wonder of wonders, we see that this man has a revelation of who this one next to him really is. And, and he wants to be associated with him, not just in the punishment that they're enduring, but he wants to be associated with him forever. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. You know, he never would have said that if God hadn't shown him something of who he really was, what his kingdom was really like. And something of the loving and merciful character of this almighty king of heaven. The one who was hanging there for the love of sinners like you and me. And he trusted, this thief did, that Jesus could reconcile him to God and bring him home. He says, remember me. You know, he's counting on Jesus' loving memory of the one who, who hung beside him in his final hours. All of his other friends had deserted him, right? But he's got that guy on the cross next to him. He's counting, this thief is, that, that Jesus wouldn't remember his sin. He's, you know, that, that he would just remember him and that he would make him fit for heaven. He says, remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. He's acknowledging Jesus isn't just the king of some other place or some figurehead or whatever. But he's the king of him. Remember me when you come into my kingdom. And so here he is. He's hanging on that cross. But he would be kneeling before the Lord if he could. Right? And he utters that sweet and humble confession. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then the Lord rewards him, doesn't he, for his faith. He's wonderful. These are the words I want to hear. Truly. I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine what it must have been like? Um, can you imagine what awaited him when he got there? One of my favorite preachers likes to sort of speculate on this homecoming of that thief, right? 
And I think he's, I think he's on to something. Um, you know, you can imagine this thief all of a sudden arriving at the gate of heaven and all the angels or whatever, and well, who, who are you? Well, I, I'm a thief. I was just crucified. I died with Jesus, and uh, here I am. Well, why do, why do you think you can come? They ask him, well, who, who told you you could come here? He says, well, Jesus, that man in the middle cross. He told me I could come and I could be here. I don't know how this works. I don't know how it happened. But all I know is that I love him and I want to be with him. And he said I could be here. And that man was saved. He is a believer. You know, and, and, he's, and the angel's like, all right, come on in. You know, he's the king. What are you going to do? Right? You know, send word. To that. Go ask the Lord. Is this guy? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, sure. He says he can come in. All right, come on in, Mr. Thief. But he's not a thief anymore, is he? No, he's the beloved son of God. He's a former thief, right? He's a redeemed thief. And it's just a memory of God's mercy. That's all it is now. Jesus is the king. And his word is good enough. And that's all we need. You know, this thief is the one who shows us the way. How to rightly honor our king. How to approach him. How to come to him. And how to be with him. This is it. And, you know, and Luke, interestingly, is the only one who shares this story. He's the only one who notes down the thief's conversion. And I wonder if he did that because Luke identified with the thief himself. Luke is thinking, you know, that one's, that one's just like me. That's how I felt. I've got to put that story in because it illustrates how new Christians are made and how people come to know the king. I'm so glad he put that story in, aren't you? Let's pray. Lord Christ, open our eyes. You are plainly in the business of opening hearts and minds. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear the things of your gospel, your good news. Help us to see that you are king of all, that you are glorious and mighty, and you are also one who loves thieves and robbers and brings them home, cleans them up, and rejoices over them. Pray, Lord, that you would come to us, that we would be rejoiced over by you in the final day. Help us to trust you, Lord, and to love you. For Jesus' sake, amen.